Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Dr. Justin Smith, and I serve as our Director of Student Life for Forbes College and a member of the Office of the Dean of Undergraduate Students here at Princeton. FOCUS is an interdisciplinary initiative sponsored and designed by my office to bring anti-racist scholarship, thought, and action to every part of the university life. The name and mission of FOCUS were inspired by the words of Toni Morrison, a recipient of the 1993 Nobel Peace Prize, Nobel Prize, excuse me, in literature, and one of Princeton's most illustrious faculty members. As Princeton recommits itself to racial equity, the goal of FOCUS is to keep anti-racism at the forefront of campus dialogue. FOCUS is intended to bring unparalleled expertise, insight, and considered thought to the difficult but necessary conversations that lie ahead. We aspire to a world in which everyone can focus on what really matters, free from the distraction of racism. We are grateful for the opportunity to collaborate with the Department of African American Studies and the Humanities Council in tonight's program. <laughs> Imani Perry, the Hughes Rogers Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University and a faculty associate in the program, in, in, excuse me, faculty associate with the programs in law and public affairs, gender and sexuality studies, and jazz studies. She's the author of six acclaimed books, including Looking for Lorraine, The Radiant and Radical Life of Lorraine Hansberry, May We Forever Stand, a historical, excuse me, a history of the black national anthem, and Breathe, A Letter to My Sons. Her most recent work, a travelogue entitled South to America, A Journey Below the Mason-Dixon to Understand the Soul of a Nation, becomes available at the end of this month. Professor Perry is also a contributing writer at The Atlantic and the author of its newsletter, Unsettled Territory. Perry is a scholar of law, literary, and cultural studies, and an author of creative nonfiction. She earned her PhD in American Studies from Harvard University, a JD from Harvard Law School, an LLM from Georgetown University Law Center, and a BA from Yale College in Literature and American Studies. Her writing and scholarship primarily focuses on the history of black thought, art, and imagination crafted in response to and resistance against the social, political, and legal realities of, the dominating, of domination in the West. Like Ms. Broom, Imani Perry has roots in the South, and is a native of Birmingham, Alabama. Sarah Broom is a trained journalist and celebrated author. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, and elsewhere. In 2016, Broom received the prestigious Whiting Award for Creative Nonfiction, which allowed her to finish her first book, The Yellow House. Her groundbreaking work received the National Book Award in 2019. Broom received her undergraduate degree in anthropology and mass communications from the University of North Texas before earning a master's degree in journalism from the University of California, Berkeley. She began her writing career as a newspaper journalist working in Rhode Island, Dallas, New Orleans, and Hong Kong for Time Asia. Broom worked as an editor at O, the Oprah Magazine, for several years, writing in the hours before and after work. In the years following, Broom worked extensively in, non in the nonprofit world, including as executive director of the global nonprofit Village Health Works, which has offices in Burundi and New York. She has taught nonfiction in Columbia University's creative writing department. And Sarah Broom loves solitude, travel, making a beautiful room, and the possibility of getting lost. A native New Orleanian, she is the youngest of 12 children. Sarah Broom currently calls New York her home, and we are honored and thrilled to have her in conversation with Imani Perry today. Following our conversation, we will have an opportunity to take questions from our audience, including those currently watching via live stream. All are invited to submit questions via comments, and we look forward to an illuminating conversation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, welcome to Princeton. <laughs> Imani. How you doing? Good. I'm so happy to talk with you always. I feel the same way. And um, notwithstanding the unusual circumstances, it's such a gift to be able to be in conversation with you. We have these conversations usually privately, so it's wonderful to get to share so some we're of We're going to have questions. some version of one publicly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I wanted to start actually sort of where where that lovely introduction ended mm. with making a room 
and I specifically wanted to ask you, and I, I would, I'll say it this way, as a reader of your work, I think your attention to space, architecture, um, geographies is just, it, it's so gorgeous and powerful. Um, and I don't, I don't, but I don't know if, the re if a reader necessarily knows how the minutia of your attention to all, mm. of, to all of those things. So I want to ask you about um, seating mm. and settees, because we've had these, mm. we've talked about um, our, our grandmother's furniture yeah. in the past. And can you talk about maybe just a little bit of why, about why furnishings for you are mm. this important, I don't know, these important artifacts? Mm. Oh my God, see this is, <laughs> this is really approximating how we talk to uh -huh. each other, right? Um, this is so interesting because I think the, there's this wonderful little pamphlet called um, uh, A Desk in Exile. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I still have trouble with is thinking more philosophically about furniture, about objects, about space, about myself in space, mm -hmm. about the things that compose me in space, about myself in relation to you, for instance, yeah, in space. Yeah. And, and maybe furniture is one sort of approximation of how we think about space. And then, of course, there is this sort of, the, I feel this very spiritually. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what I think the, the artist Whitfield Lavelle is yeah. trying to get at oh, when yes. he paints on the walls. Because I also am very connected to the chair, the object, um, as having this history. Even actually approaching this particular chair, I was like, oh, the seat is so worn. I wonder who was here before me, mm -hmm. right? Um, that there are these containers yeah. that, that we can sort of find to start to think about history and time and travel through time and and that maybe there are traces in that, in yeah. that right? That mm -hmm. we somehow can think about geography, history, loss, yeah. um, my love for you, my respect for you mm -hmm. um, through this particular chair, or these two chairs. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's I, one of the things that I'm, I, I don't remember, I was, and I think you had posted it on, on on Instagram, there was a, a chair, and I was thinking that looks like a seat in mm -hmm. my grandmother's house. And one of the things that's so remarkable to me about whole, having those pieces is the kind of care that they put into maintaining them. So, I'm like, how does, you know, that chair my grandmother bought in the 40s look better than the one I bought four years ago? <laughs> oh, right. right. Sorry. Um, and that, right, and so to care, it's a connection and it's mm -hmm. also, it's a tradition of some sort, right, to hold on to. It is, it yeah. is, I mean, the object, right? And I mean, it's interesting because in the Yellow House, for instance, mm -hmm. I was thinking about this the other day because I saw my niece who I hadn't seen in forever. And because I have so many siblings, some of them were having children at the same time as my mom. Mm. And this niece of mine, you know, going back to me being an aunt before I could talk. Yes. This niece of mine was born a month before me, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so we would sleep in the same slipper chair. My mom had these sort of gold fabric slipper uh, chairs. Yes. And me and this niece, who is called Toka, we would lay side by side in this slipper chair. And that was sort of the way that we grew up, mm -hmm. essentially, together, right? Sleeping yeah. in this chair. Oh. and I. I remember that chair and I wonder about that chair and, and I think th this is also something that in the sense that we write towards something that we want to see more of, I think reading the philosopher Gaston Bachelard mm. in Poetics of Space and thinking, well, why does he get to write about the bureau or the armoire and make all of these sort of connections between a door and how we sort of imagine ourselves in the world. Yes. You know, how is he doing that? 
yeah. and why, how can I do some approximation of that? And, and why isn't it done more? Oh, I love that. Right? Yeah. Um, so, the, so the sort of object that carries us, that has all of these sort of significances for us, the object as signifier and mm -hmm. maybe even signified and possession. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and, and the sort of complication of possessing. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, part of what, what you describe resonated so deeply because my cousin Nichelle and I used to sleep foot to head on mm. my grandmother's black couch, right? And that was, and so there's the material culture piece, which we don't, I think particularly for black folks, black Americans, and black Americans in the South, there's not a, a conversation, even though material culture is so important, like mm -hmm. fabrics and textures, mm -hmm. and it, there's not, what you're describing is so true, there's not a way of even conceiving of that, right, in the, in the arena, which is why it's so important to write it, and it's also, about intimacy, right? Mm -hmm. So when I, you know, there are times when I say, okay, well, you know, sometimes we were four to a bed, but I'm also thinking about the headboard with mm. the cutouts yeah, in it and putting my that. finger in the head, right, and feeling the presence of the other kids on either side and at that, putting those together, that mm. relation, intimacy, love. So it's not just an artifact, but it's That's that, right. Yeah. And it's not all performative. It's not, I, I think in the context of black women especially, yeah. right? We, we get these sort of presentations of mm -hmm. making a home as a kind of performative, uh, almost class issue. Right. Right? It's, it's a thing for show. Right. But as human beings, there we, is a kind of mm -hmm. internal show that's going on that is about um, you know, if, if I have a great love for 12 years and I don't have it anymore, is that an object inside of me? Mm. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, how, how do I process what's sort of within and without? Oh, yeah. And, you know, as black women have been doing this, black American women have had to do this forever. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's, but it's often framed, right, yeah. as a sort of performative gesture. I mean, if you think of Tony Cade Bambara's Those Bones Are Not My Child, Ooh, yeah. that opening prologue, mm -hmm. you know, the waiting, the anxiety, the everything this woman feels, the description of her house, what it's like to be in it. Yes. You know, that's all part of a kind of, internal grounding and internal sense of self and the bed you were on. Yeah. Right? Is is part of that picture. Right. And it right and that well see that for me is part I mean the mastery and I know now you have like spent years of me being like, let me tell you what's so masterful <laughs> about the yellow house. <laughs> but, but is that it it becomes the ha the book is the house too. Right. And what you just described with Tony K. Bombard, there's and it's relation, but it's the building, the architecture, it's not so that it's, I mean, to go back to what you were saying about what is possession, right? Mm -hmm. The thing may be gone, right? Mm -hmm. The the bed itself, that couch is long gone, my own experience, mm -hmm. but the, you make, there's something that is, that you can make in the absence and yes. the loss, right? Which doesn't mean that the creation of spaces or mm -hmm. taking possession of things may, is, Irrelevant, mm -hmm. but it's also, you know, it's it's transitory. It's it's impermanent. Sure. It's, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And it, and it really right. It's sort of like in the drive to claim oneself. Mm -hmm. Right. There are things, houses, people along the way, mm -hmm. and and I think that kind of sight that what actually Toni Morrison was talking about. Right. That we're not always actually looking at you that in fact we may not be looking at you at, at all. all. Right. That actually <laughs> we're just concerned about our own claim on ourselves mm. and mm -hmm. that's worthy and that's enough. Yes. Um, and I, I, I think part of the book for me was just a kind of involuntary reflex mm. because it felt so ridiculous that I, that, that I grew up around some of the most fascinating people on planet Earth, 
and they were in a box that wasn't even on the map. Mm -hmm. I just thought, that is so bizarre. How could it be? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, it oh, just yeah. seemed like the biggest mistake I had ever come upon. You know, and, and, I, and I think, so that's part of, I think, maybe what writers do in some way. Remap. Right, right. and, and Ma reclaim, yeah. reclaim yeah. and reclaim ourselves and reclaim the things we know are valuable and mm -hmm. reclaim the space to not be worried about, you know, anyone else. else but yeah, but who's here. Yeah, somehow. So... At this point, and I'm asking this question, I mean, it's a kind of history question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think it, I want to ask it because we're in this strange interstitial space mm -hmm. historically um, where we're constantly like worried. But I'm also, you know, as, as, a, as a writer, right, you have to be deliberate mm -hmm. in everything that you attend to. Um, what feels, I don't know, I guess what feels urgent to you now? What feels like the kind of questions that you feel you need to meditate on? Both, mm. you know what I mean? Like that you're like dwelling with, that you're turning over. Oh, that's such a good question, right? Um, I think my questions are always very philosophical. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think the best questions just make you seek more. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, they never ever prompt resolution. Never. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's so weird to be because I've been spending so much time in New Orleans yeah. recently, and New Orleans just feels like it's at the forefront of this conversation about climate. Mm -hmm. And um, and yet New Orleans doesn't have the infrastructure for telling these very pressing stories. I mean, it has a, a newspaper that's been shrunk. Mm -hmm. It has it doesn't actually have the avenues that one might imagine such a city should have. Right. Um, and it has people who are in despair. Yeah. Right? I mean, Ida was no joke. Everyone is still rebuilding. And we have this going on in small ways throughout the country. Mm -hmm. So I think right now I'm very preoccupied with what we're not hearing yeah. in this sort of big sound system that seems to be happening where mm -hmm. people are very obsessed with detail, but detail about what? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and I, I'm sort of listening for sub frequencies, if that makes sense, and just yeah. trying to understand sort of where, you know, I always thought of myself as, as a writer. You know, I'm more, I'm definitely more Billie Holiday in the sense of, you know, I'm way behind the beat. You know, the song has gone, and then I'll like come in, you know, and I'm not I like ahead analogy. of the song or yeah. even with the song. Yeah. You know, and so I, I think trying to sort of, and the Yellow House was really about that because time had gone by and mm -hmm. no one was really thinking in the same way about what happened in 2005. And so the questions for me are, are very much the questions about creation. Mm -hmm. What does mm -hmm. it mean to make in this world? What are the important things to say? How do you say it? How are you new? How do you make discoveries? Is it still possible to get lost? Mm, mm -hmm. Right? What are the spaces we make intended for? Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think they're about quality of life somehow. Mm -hmm. What about you? What are, what are the questions that are? Oh. Well, I, I mean, I think related to what you're saying, is I find there's this incredible urgency to this mm -hmm. moment, right? Mm -hmm. And I was, I was thinking but also because, you know, right, so you have, mm -hmm. you have been in journalism and mm -hmm. in health, right? And in health yeah. and, and, right, these areas, right, that have 
that are at the cutting mm -hmm. edge, right? Mm -hmm. In the same way that New Orleans is at the mm -hmm. cutting edge, mm -hmm. right? And so, and I think, you know, there's moments where I'm like, okay, well, I've studied law, and like, you mm -hmm. know, we're talking about voting rights, and we're talking about, but I don't want to be in the frenetic pace of the moment because these are really, really difficult mm -hmm. challenges. Mm -hmm. And at some level, I think they're bringing us to core questions, mm -hmm. right? And so how do we, how does one be, and the question for me is like, how do, how do you be in the world, as, how am I in the world ethically, not you know, trying to mm -hmm. put out, and some fires do need to mm -hmm. be, you know, some things need an urgent response, but with care, right, yes. with this vision of, of trying to do something that we, or make things that we can carry with us mm -hmm. over the, you know, over the next mountain, which is coming, mm -hmm. right, things are changing, mm -hmm. right, these assumptions, these expectations about what our lives will be like in 10 years and 20 mm -hmm. years. I don't think we can hold them as carefully. And so I think that's also about making space. Who's in your space? How do you care for mm -hmm. who's who's with you? What are the terms of that care? What happens when those things are snatched from mm -hmm. underneath you, mm -hmm. right? And um, right, and that's, there are storms that are examples mm -hmm. of that, but there's also these sort of other metaphoric storms of, you know, the pandemic mm -hmm. and, loss of all mm -hmm. sorts of things and so I guess trying to figure out what how to be of use mm -hmm. and also to fulfill what feels like the thing that is both soul nurturing and meaningful right right like that's that, it, it yeah. I mean it, this goes back to what we we're talking about at the start right it's it's sort of the traces what gets left behind mm -hmm the old chair that we recover. Yes. It's sort of, I mean, I think particularly, and I wonder how you feel in your with your own work, but it's sort of like, what does the body of work even look like anymore, right? How, how what's the job really? Right. Um, as writers and as thinking people, it feels like, you know, this reminds me of the James Baldwin, when James Baldwin said, you know, I hope someone will find me in the in the rubbish, in the right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it, it's like, what, you know, what are we trying to do in mm -hmm. terms of the work we make? And 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 to to think about impact feels strange. For right. Me. At least in the conventional way. Right? right. I mean, I remember I had this moment when I was very ill as a as a young woman when I said, I don't know if I'll be able to do all these things I mm -hmm. want to do. And I was like, I'm going and I said, I'm gonna focus on making blankets, right? And mm -hmm. I, because I love to crochet, and I was like, I'm gonna crochet blankets because it's something that I know somebody will be able to hold in mm -hmm. the future, right? Like I was like, I don't know if I'll be able to write these books, mm -hmm. or I don't know if I'll be able to like, you know, go do these degrees or doing it. But I, and I do. There's that same feeling now, like, mm -hmm. and it's not a personal illness, but like the sort of the state of the world, where it's like, you know, something precious to hold on to as opposed to a legacy written in the sky in mm -hmm. some way, you know. Yeah, that's right. right. But I think that's also the tradition, like those are, that, I think that sensibility, mm -hmm. I mean, certainly for the writers you've, you referenced, mm -hmm. that's, that's part of our tradition, like the, the standing in a tradition mm -hmm. of people who approach the work that way, mm -hmm. even if later they become, you know. Right. Yeah. And it, I mean, that is the paying attention, right? The, yeah. the blanket is the paying attention. The mm -hmm. crocheting is the paying attention. And so maybe that's the job, that there's, you know, that paying attention yeah. is actual work. And, and I know it is, because there are so many times in the course of a day when I don't want to pay attention, <laughs> mm -hmm. because it's just too much, right? Mm -hmm. um, so figuring out how that becomes the essence of the work itself yeah. going forward, right? Just the, the act of, um, there's this New Orleans artist, Kevin Beasley, Oh, and, yes. and there was a New York Times piece about him, and in it, it says, just showing up was the art. Mm. For him, just showing up was the art. And, and I think for me in this particular moment, that has such great resonance. Can I ask you a question about art? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, because one of the things, and it's, I think, again, it's one of those, those, 
it's apparent you you you're a person who crafts sentences and geographies and narrative, but it's, there's a visual component, and it's very clear that, that, that visual art is important to your work, and I'm wondering um, if there's work, whether Kevin Beasley or mm -hmm. other artists, that at this moment you're finding as a source, mm -hmm. as you're working on, mm -hmm. you know, what you're making. Mm -hmm. You know, there is, and it keeps changing, which I think is okay. so exciting. Um, there's this New Orleans artist called Don Dado, okay, who has a big exhibition now at the New Orleans Museum of Art. Uh -huh. and, and it's been great to sort of go there. I was thinking about um, the writer Hashem Matar, okay. a month in Siena, and he, he would go over time and look at the same painting um, over and over, sometimes for a year. Mm -hmm. And so it's been so nice in New Orleans to show up and look at this work of Don Dado, who does these sort of, has this kind of cosmologic, astral space yeah. preoccupation. And it's these huge, overwhelming images, right? Mm -hmm. um, some of which are about the world and destruction and the end of the world. Mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, right now I'm just in love with artists of all kinds. Yeah. And I live with an artist and yes. I think sound and and thinking about rhythm and um, I mean art is shoring me up in ways I never anticipated, you know. So it'll be interesting to see in the next work I'm making mm -hmm. how how it gives me courage to do or not do certain things, because I think that's always the thing, right? We're making little boats for each new story. Yeah. Um, also known as structure. Yes. And so <laughs> I think art is the thing that helps you take risk when you're doing that. Mm -hmm. So I think Don Dado is somebody who is giving me a lot of courage. Yeah. I just love that example because I, um, I think there's, I think particularly for non, particularly for nonfiction, I think there is a way that um, people often consider it as somehow something other mm -hmm. than art. Mm -hmm. When in many ways it's, I mean, it's a lot like painting, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's a car, you know, it, it's capturing mm -hmm. something that's between imagination and the materiality of the world, as it. You it know. really is. I mean, you know that. I mean, there is so much in character and mm -hmm. movement yeah. and pace and tone. Um, you know, Didion used to always say, you know, nonfiction is so much harder because I already know the story. Yes. So you spend all this time about how you tell it. Yeah. Right. I, I think you actually are still discovering in nonfiction if you do Absolutely. a certain kind of nonfiction. Mm -hmm. But I know what she means, that fiction you're making it up and you get to have this sort of wild relationship to the work. Right. But nonfiction requires a kind of discipline and knack because you have to move people through something that can feel very, very um, staid. And I think the question is like, how do you elevate, you know, the world of nonfiction mm -hmm. so that people are as caught up in it? Yes. Um, and how do you speed up the story and slow the story down when you only have a certain collection of facts, right? You can't make stuff up. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And you also can't, you know, I can't just can't kill one of fact. my characters right. if they're alive, <laughs> right? right? I mean, yeah. it, they have to sort of be alive. So yeah. it has its own challenges in that way. And yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's wonderful. I, I want to give people an opportunity to ask some questions, um, but I'll, uh, before quickly beforehand and you all can ask questions or the folks online but is there anything that you have um, read recently that is unexpected mm. um, and has been sort of meaningful or affecting mm. it can be like small thing but hmm or a fact or a like a thing that I so Dorothy Allison wrote this book called I know do you know this book I know two or three things for sure I don't know that one okay so I actually know Dorothy I thought I knew Dorothy Allison okay 
but I, I never heard of it. I don't know where I got the reference. But anyway, I got this book. It's a tiny book. It's like 40 pages. Okay. Oh, my God. It's great. It's called I Know Two or Three Things for Sure. And you will appreciate this because you, you know, just have written this amazing tome about the South. Which is, there's a, a cave part that is directly inspired by Dorothy Alice's oh, see, Cave so, Dwellers. Okay, so, yeah, so okay. you, you need to. And so, but just the, the story, how she tells it, the, the magic in the structure itself, oh. how she, how it, it, it reminds me so much of, it's funny, I feel like this book and Lucille Clifton's Generations oh. are like talking with one another. You know, there's that moment in the beginning of Lucille Clifton's Generations where they have the phone call. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like the white lady who's like, you know, I'm a sales, I think your people are sales. And, mm -hmm. and the character's like, mm, not <laughs> sure who you are. Mm -hmm. But I almost feel like, Dorothy Allison's family were that woman on the other side of the phone. So I, it, it's been so much fun yes. oh, to wow. think about generations, to think about what Dorothy Allison, and, and also this, the writing is, she's, yeah. she's <laughs> I mean, it's really, it's really something else. So that, so that has been blowing my mind. Okay, yeah. Um, in small and big ways. And it's so hot, you know, I just want to write this. I have a fantasy of a book that's just so mm -hmm. small mm -hmm. and, and tight yeah, and yeah. just like, you know? Yeah, yeah. I can't wait to read it. Do we have any questions? I can keep going. Well, we do have a question online and I'll read the first okay. one. Um, the first question I have is, what struck me in the Yellow House is how the impact of Katrina depended greatly on the race and socioeconomic status of residents. It got me thinking about the intersection of climate change and environmental racism. As a journalist, what do you think we should watch for in this area over the next few years? I think it probably everything. Mm -hmm. um, You know, I think what's really challenging now with what's happening with the environment and the climate and geography is that um, the place has already been built. This is what's the way tricky about it, right? The place has already been built. So, so mm -hmm. the, the thing has already been sort of put into motion. And I think we're at a moment in our country right now, mm -hmm. right, where we see the we're reaping what has already been sort of put into motion. Yes. And, and that's terrifying in the sense that it's very hard to know, you know, what happens now. But I do know the power of all of us collectively. Um, and, and I think... You know, it's hard to say because it's, there's always the question of what are the actual policies? Mm -hmm. You know, I hate to use the P word, policies, right. but like what actually creates change right. in the world? Um, you know, uh, yeah. like how do we actually move the needle? Because this is sort of baked into the fabric of the place. Well, see, that's, I mean, I feel like when I read The Yellow House, I said, this is about a design problem mm -hmm. in some core way. It's a design problem, right. which is really my obsession. It's, it's, and so I don't know, actually, that I have the answer, right, about what to do about mm -hmm. the design problem. But I think part of it is the work we do to call out the design, to illuminate the design. Yes, right. To, to say, we have to figure out some way collectively, I mean, <laughs> not politically, not, mm -hmm. but collectively as human beings, yeah. to, to do something different. And, and I don't exactly know, I'm, I'm joining hands with everyone mm -hmm. I know who can mm -hmm. think about this, but, um, but the design is there. Yeah. 
And, and I think, you know, in New Orleans, there's a lot of debate about, um, you know, whether the bridge, the Claiborne Avenue bridge is create, you know, if that bridge got taken down, then maybe that will correct some kind of <laughs> inequity that happened. And it, it's like, but that already happened. Mm -hmm. So then what, right? Um, and so in the current model, I think, how do we make spaces for questions, for pushing, for advocating, for advocacy, yeah. um, and for actual change? I don't know. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Oh, <laughs> I mean, I think this is, well, this is <laughs> part of the problem with the P word mm -hmm. is that it is always imagined in the pre-existing frame, right? So the, the imagination is contracted mm -hmm. by the frame, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's sort of like, well, if we make this corrective, right? You mm -hmm. bring in the structural engineers and they make mm -hmm. that corrective, but you make a particular corrective without correcting an order which presumes that some people are going to be hungry and some people are going to be out of work and some people are going to be forced to work under horrific conditions. And so, so that, you know, and then people say, oh, well, we tried this thing, but it didn't work. Well, but, but you know, you, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's like, you know, a, a, a Band-Aid on a, you know, mm -hmm. on a, on a, on a levee crashing down, mm -hmm. essentially, right? you know, these sure. moments, right? It's sort of like these, so I think it is a, I mean, at the core, there's a crisis of political imagination and every time we get sort of we move to the edge of like thinking maybe we can redo this and people are sort of pushed back into fear mm -hmm. right and so um i think the question especially and i you know i feel like i'm always putting pressure on young people but <laughs> you know yeah y'all the folks with the imagination mm -hmm. like it just it, it it has to be to sure. push beyond what has existed, it's untenable now. It is unsustainable, mm -hmm. right? And COVID shows that in a way like nothing is. else, yeah. right? It truly, it, and it, there are so many code words for everything. I mean, in, in New Orleans, the big thing is like preservation. Right. But what does preservation mean? mean? Preserving what exactly? And mm -hmm. how much does it cost? Right. And so the moment we begin to unravel that, we see the huge fallacy in that. Yeah. Oh. And, right? So that's part of it. Yeah. Well, see, this is why I thought I loved the way that you, you instead of in other books, and I'm not criticizing any of the books, but the mm -hmm. reference was Katrina, Katrina, the storm, the storm, right, the storm. Right. You talked about the water. Mm -hmm. It's a different, it's a paradigm shift mm -hmm. because the water is ever present and the mm -hmm. water and, mm -hmm. and a relationship between land and people mm -hmm. and water is a different orientation than the crisis moment. Sure. And that, and the, <laughs> the water, I mean, I could, I think I'll be writing about water till the day I die. Like I'll probably yeah. be on my deathbed yelling out water yes. because it is for me the heart of everything. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's the kind of existential challenge, yeah. right? It's a human and bodily challenge of a, a, a species made of water. Mm. It's what's happening in our world and how hard it is to control it. Narratively and spiritually, yeah. it's water. You know, and, and it's like the central issue, mm -hmm. <laughs> really. And, and, and I, I, I think it's really um, a problem when things are miscast. Mm. And, you know, it was also just a very, very um, direct way to retell, to tell the story of August 2005 in a way that was the truth about it, right? That this had nothing to do with Katrina, mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, you know, water came crashing in yes. because of official negligence. Mm, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so the, you know, that, that idea of, of what we do about water in all of its various tumultuous and also ecstatic forms, yes. maybe is the obsessive question. question to answer your earlier, I love earlier question. 
There is another question. Did you have a question? So um, I'm going to try to phrase this in the way that I want it to come out. But um, my question is basically about um, the writing process itself. Um, and with something so, so personal and intimate to you, like how do you know that the writing process is over? Or how often do you return to, to these thoughts and, and, and the things that you write in this book um, after, having, after having been published and kind of, you know, I guess, immortalized in its current form? Mm. Mm. What a great question. I think that when I'm... It, it can't be um, overestimated how mapped out the book is. It's so... It's such a precise sliver of something. And, and in the sort of design of it, one of the ways that I have no emotion about it is that um, I remember when I was first working on this book, I would be on the phone with various friends and I'd be like, you know, the narrator. And they'd be like, you? <laughs> and I'd just be like, no, the narrator. And, then, and I'd say like, you know, this character, Curl, you know, he's like a maroon. And they'd be like, your brother Curl? <laughs> no, this, this character. So I think for me, right, I, I see this as so specifically a story that I'm trying to tell. And, and so if this story that I'm trying to tell is a concentric circle, the sort of point in the middle is that house. And then, and then I write the stories that are on each rung from that central point. Mm. And that is a very specific story I'm telling. And all these people are the supporting cast of the house's story, including myself, right? So in this book, I think that's one of the ways that I can't think of it as a story of myself, because it's a story of me in a particular world, which is different from the story of myself. Maybe one day I can write that. Um, so I don't think of it actually in such personal terms, uh, maybe it's like a psychic trick. The moment before the book came out and I did think of it in very personal terms, it was devastating. Mm. Because I you know, was worried what people would think. And you know, I was a journalist, so my siblings, I recorded them, they knew what, you know, what was gonna be in it. And I, I didn't read the book to them, but they had a really good sense of what was coming, right? So that was like my sort of ethical thing. But I think um, because it was so finite a world for me and so specific a world, um, I almost feel like it's not about me, which could just be a delusion. <laughs> Does that answer your question? OK, good. So I think in your work, right, you're crafting so specifically that it's like the narrative serves a self, a certain self that is like, yes, me, some version of me, some portion of me, but not me as you see me now, perhaps, right? Mm -hmm. Is that just? <laughs> no, I mean, it makes a, it help, you know, it's funny when people with, with breathe when people would say, oh, mm -hmm. how do your sons feel about having mm -hmm. been written about? And I'm like, well, they're not those people now. Right, right. Right, like that was mm -hmm. a moment in develop, but every, the relationship lives, mm -hmm. right? right? So right. It's, a, it's a picture. It is. It's an artifact. It goes mm -hmm. from being you to being something, and thank goodness. Mm -hmm. I know right? otherwise it would be, I mean, it's, <laughs> it is weird because when I was, I remember when I was transcribing interviews, I wasn't talking to my siblings. And they'd call and be like, what's going on with you? What's wrong with you? Right. And I'd say, but I just talked to you. And they'd be like, no, you, no, didn't. you didn't. You know, <laughs> so I was confusing the sort of their voice in my ear mm. with this relate. And so I think when the book was done, I could resume a kind of way yes. that I have with them, which is not at all about who they are in this sort of freeze frame. 
Do you feel, do you experience that with New Orleans at all? In the sense, does the city feel different to you after? Or the place, mm -hmm. or the, or east in particular? Like mm -hmm. how? Right. I think with New Orleans, I feel like I just know it less and less and less. Mm. Oh, wow. OK. I, like each, it, like I think my, I think I mostly feel that I only hit the tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. in this book. So I'm like, you know, I have to go away from New Orleans in the next book. But there's some part of me that's just like, I just want to be obsessed, like, you know, widen with Homewood and Diddy and with California. Like, I yeah. just need to go back and keep, like, banging yeah. against something because it just feels more and more strange to me. I'm like, is every place this strange or? Yeah. You know, so I see it, I'm knowing it differently. And and it's it's a place, I mean, all, all cities are living, but mm -hmm. one of the things that stands out and I, I'll just admit, mm -hmm. many of the things that people describe as unique to New Orleans, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think, it, but I do mm -hmm. think it's, it has a vitality <laughs> mm -hmm. in terms of encounter, mm -hmm. right? So the whole world meets yeah. there constantly, which is, I, I mean, I think is. Yeah, it's, I, I think, right, exactly. For me, the strength of New Orleans is the community. I mm -hmm. think there's no, there are no communities like the, I yeah. really think this is true. Mm. It's the people, it's how they experience themselves in the company of others with other people. It, it's, it's just an unusual and amazing strength of the place. Yeah. But that's precisely what the issue is too at the heart of it all, right? Because if you have an education system where every, school is a charter school and every child is being bused yes. out of a community to a school that is not in the community. Right. And all so the teachers are happens? destabilized. And, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. When, when the teachers who are part of the community are no longer part of the community. So this also brings us back into doubling in on ourselves mm. and, and, and saying, okay, so if that's a great strength of the place, then yeah. what happens when that's gone? Are there other questions? Yes. Hello, um, my name is Gilles. I, I sort of missed the beginning, um, so forgive me if my question sounds repetitive. But um, in terms of writing um, nonfiction and a story about yourself, I was wondering, was there a point when you knew that you were ready to revisit that time? I think, I think for me, so many experiences, I've always wanted to like document um, sort of some experiences I've had in the past, but I never know when I'm ready to go back. Mm -hmm. And I'm also, I think there's this um, conflict. And am I judging or am I assessing what happened with my eyes now, with what I know now? Mm -hmm. Is that the right approach? Or should I just go with, you know, what I, should I try to just reproduce um, the moment as I was experiencing it? And, mm -hmm. and like, I never feel ready. So that's why I just keep writing mm -hmm. fiction. Um, because mm. it's just a product of my imagination. Um, so I'm wondering if when you were writing that, so did you get to a point where you're like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to go back and, and, mm. and write it? Yeah, thank you. That's such a good question. There are so many questions in there, right? Because part of the question actually is, a, I think, a question about form. Like what maybe are the perceived limitations of the form? Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and, and I want to answer a question about is there a right time to go back? But I think with the form question, I think that was the struggle I had structurally in the book and why there's this sort of weird omniscient narration happening in the beginning um, because I'm not born yet and structurally I can't, I didn't feel that I could exist in the book and have the same narrative, right? Mm -hmm. So, but for me, in terms of, I've always been a notebook keeper um, in a very serious way. I mean, you know, from 14, 12 or so on. And I have all these notebooks. So there was a literal way that I could go back. Mm -hmm. And so many of the quotations in the book are, in fact, things I had in my notebook or 
like, you know, when I was writing a letter to a childhood friend, I had the letter, mm -hmm. you know, in the notebook. So, so I had these sort of artifacts and objects that I could refer to that put me in a place. But it was very, very painful. The, to write this book was very, very painful because um, it, it is, I think, a book about loss also and um, revisiting any form of loss, the loss of my father, the loss of my childhood friend, what it, what it has meant to be you know, the sole survivor on the scene um, it was was really hard, and and I think you know uh, Kiesi Lehman says it best maybe when he he talks about you know taking care of your heart meat, you know and like when you're writing hard things you you have to be minding yourself, and there is no good time right you just sort of feel the compulsion maybe to do it and. Um, and, and you start, and, and then maybe, as in the work I'm doing now, you maybe don't feel much compulsion, <laughs> but you just sort of jump in, and then you mm -hmm. start to understand mm -hmm. why you're so ready, right? But yeah, there, there isn't a right moment, and I think um, the form thing is real, but I, I, for me, I'm not a make up the quote that they, I think they said, person, so I tried in form. So like W.G. Zabal does interesting things where he, you know, when people are talking to each other in, in the present and, and he can flash back to the past. Mm. So I was just like reading other writers and trying to figure out how they go between past and present because there is an adult sensibility in the book, but for me it didn't exist in the first hundred pages. Mm. You have a question? I have a question over here. Um, the question reads, in your work, you mentioned feeling absence more strongly than feeling presence. What advice would you give students feeling absent from family while trying to take full advantage of all Princeton has to offer? Mm. Mm. I mean, that is such a wow, right? <laughs> Because the, the, I mean, you must have stuff to say about this, Imani, but like the, I think my other obsession has to do with leaving and coming back. Yes. And it's something I still practice a lot, leaving and coming back. And the thing that is so constitutional about me is that there is no one I want to impress more than the people from my family or from my street in New Orleans. Really, I think that will never change. And that connection, right? It's like, how do you have that strong connection happening? Because mm -hmm. it's, I think, that connection that for me is the feeder, mm. you know? And, and there are so many funny stories of, you know, my mom calling Berkeley Barclays yeah. and like people laughing in the family, mm -hmm. you know? Because mm -hmm. it's like, this woman, really has no concept of yeah. you know whatever thing you're doing mm -hmm. at Berkeley and and like that feeling like a relief to me yes mm -hmm. you know and and so i think that is a that's a challenge though right because everyone has a different family we don't know what the situation is but i think that is so real to somehow find a way to be elsewhere and be cultivating this other self and then reuniting mm -hmm. all of that with whatever is your conception of home. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what do you think, Imani? You know, I, I, I always think about, I had a, a teacher in high school, Janet Eisendrath, who, who ran up to me one day, and it's a really kind of profound moment, and she had tears streaming down her face, and she said, you're the only one who understands what it feels like to be homesick wherever you are. Mm -hmm. And... And that was to a certain extent true, but not, I didn't, I didn't feel homesick when I was at home, mm -hmm. in my home mm -hmm. in Birmingham, but most of the time I wasn't at home, mm -hmm. right? And so for me, this question is really profound because so many of us spend most of our lives away from mm -hmm. the home in the, vo the most core sense mm -hmm. of the word, and yet have to find ways, not just of carrying it with us, but mm. actually 
being what we mm-hmm. have learned to be mm-hmm. through home, right? Mm-hmm. So when I say, you know, it, it sounds, and I I'm always say that it sounds trite because it does sound trite when I say, you know, my grandmother was the smartest person I ever knew. Um, everything I've ever written comes from her, but it it's true, mm-hmm. right? Because she taught me how to see, mm-hmm. right? How to interpret mm-hmm. in the most you know in the most fundamental way, and I so I think it doesn't. So all that to say, you don't, you know, at Princeton or any other university or any other way that you're away from home, that doesn't, you're not going to be able to replace homesickness mm-hmm. or missing or, mm-hmm. you know, the intimacy, the security. If home is an intimate, secure place, mm-hmm. it's not for everyone. But if it is, you're not going to, but there are ways of being what it is mm-hmm. that you most cherish in these places. And when you combine that with just incredible opportunities out mm-hmm. in the world. I think something really beautiful can mm-hmm. come of it, right? And so, sure. you know, but it requires courage. And the self is a is a sort of, well, a literal home. Yes, that's true. And the the way that we are home for ourselves and for other yeah. people is worth cultivating. That's right. Um, because okay, can I ask? Because that makes me want to talk to you. Because one of the I, I've the way you've talked about Harlem mm-hmm. having been a home, for, I, I'm, I find it deeply moving. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's beca- you, it's a place you made yours. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because there is, I have this knack for making many families and many sort yeah. of homes. It's like my thing. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because. I'm a geography person, and I, and if I feel untethered, that's a problem for yeah. me. Mm-hmm. So I'm always trying to ground, find grounding, and have a compass yeah. to know where I am. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> it might just be I don't know, I don't know something about me. Yeah. And so um, Harlem, and and really the people in Harlem, mm-hmm. the way they are, how they pay attention to you how they monitor, you know, your comings and goings. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how um, interested they are. Yeah. You know, how they peacock in the streets. You know, that it's like that sensuality, I think, that made me feel like I was home, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and, and that's very real for me still. So I think we go out in search of it yes. in ways. And sometimes we find things that we don't have anywhere else. And, and that becomes our orientation of home that we can give to someone else. Mm-hmm. Be- because I think, I mean, you know, I, 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 my mind was taken there because I do think, you know, we talk a lot about universities and institutions as often places that can feel, um, you know, distant and cold, and but you... They are also these, you know, crossroads, mm-hmm. and you can find your people in there. And so it's mm-hmm. like, sort of, how do you exactly what you describe? Mm-hmm. How do you find your people? What is your geography through the space mm-hmm. that allows you to craft some sense mm-hmm. of belonging, which may not be what is sort of a preordained understanding of what it means to belong to Princeton or anywhere else, mm-hmm. right? That's it true. may just be your, you know, maybe you're like three or four disaffected friends who cook dinner together mm-hmm. once a week that becomes a home, right? I mean, like yeah. those, those, and I, you know, I think in, I mean, it's a very different kind of crossroads, but Harlem is another crossroads mm-hmm. place. It's, it was a destination, yes. a place to make it, right? Mm-hmm. So, and of course, there's generations there now, but mm-hmm. the, those types of places have a possibility kind mm-hmm. of built in too. That's right? true. Yeah, these aren't, these are very specific yeah. Places that make put us in a certain mindset, yeah, about what it means to be alive, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think maybe being part of that story is yet another way of finding a geography, yeah, mm-hmm. right? It, it's it, it's a, a way of consuming narrative and engaging in one's own narrative, mm-hmm. the choice of where to be, yeah, and so maybe that's part of it too, right? You, wherever you come, or if you're at Princeton or elsewhere, then that is a geography you've chosen, and that's part of the narrative 
that you compose about the self. Yes. And it's like figuring out what that means to you on some existential level. That is the piece that gets you to home, mm -hmm. right? Somehow. Yes, yes. Hi, kind of along similar lines, I had a question about space and tourism. How would you differentiate engaging with a space from touring a space? And how would you encourage your readers to engage with the space that you're describing both in the context of your novel and outside of it, rather than merely just touring it? Mm. Mm, that's good. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so interesting because as somebody who travels a lot, I'm always like, oh, am I just being a tourist, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right now? Um, so I'm trying to think about the ways in which I engage spaces. I think part of it for me, it's, for me in my mind, it's a bit trickier when it's a highly mythologized place, right? Because there is a frame that a lot of people have and you hear it in the questions they ask, you hear it in the things they care about, right? And sometimes it's as simple as forgetting about that frame, not caring about those things, and actually listening and learning about what people are actually talking about and what matters to them, right? And telling that story when you get back home, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to sort of the well-trotted out narrative. And, you know, New Orleans is a town um, of baked in stories and in ways this happens in Harlem too. But I think, so I think that openness, and, and it's actually what I try to do is get out of the car wherever I am <laughs> and walk around or ride a bike or, you know, say hi to people, get to know people, feel lost, feel confused, be clear about the fact that I know very little, um, and, and be an explorer in that way, I think. Um, that's what I would say. I, it, but I actually think it's harder for people to do, I, I actually know this after having written this book, like it's so much easier for people to talk about Katrina and you know, how terrible that was than to talk about city planning or why is it that there was a short end of a long street or why is it that you had to cross, you know, a, a highway on your way to school or to the grocery store? Why, why is that? Why is zoning that way? Those are the harder, more challenging questions. So if people could engage around those things having to do with mapping and systemic um, and justice, that's already going quite far, I think, mm -hmm. to not just touring. And you're a walker. Oh, yes. Everywhere, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, I love to walk. I mean, it, and you get a different mm -hmm. um, public transportation, too, but walking is the, like you're on the ground, you just see the relationships mm -hmm. in between space in ways that are different from if you're just taking Absolutely. the official tours, right? And yeah. it tells you so much. When you're in a place that encourages walking, mm -hmm. you have a different kind of mentality yeah. about the place, about the people of that place, right? Um, when you're in a, you know, New Orleans East, one of the big tells about it changing was the driving culture, mm -hmm. that no one was walking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like going to LA, you know, when you see the, few souls at yeah. the bus stop, you go, wow. Yeah. It, it has to be hard, right? Taking public transportation in LA. Oh, it's just yeah. not meant to be. It's, they don't value, right? This sort of closeness and way of being on the street level mm -hmm. in the same way. Although I think Linnell George might have some tips on that. But um, yeah, I think that's really it, is to be clear about what the frame is. And I think Jamaica Kincaid was in a small place. Oh, yes. You know, slaps our hand until it's red on the subject of this very forcefully. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Right? It's and, elegant, and really yeah. helps us see all the connections that the things we're seeing and loving aren't the things as they are experienced by the people who hold up the narrative. Um, for the capitalist purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's so funny that you describe places that aren't walking places because I was 
I, as you said that, I was thinking, you can't walk around Birmingham unless you know mm. people. It's not a place mm -hmm. besides downtown, and really barely that, unless you know mm -hmm. something of the place. You literally, you can't want, it's not mm. a wandering place mm. at all. Right, mm. and so there's, and so there's also, I think, places, and it's also part of why I think there's so many different sort of cultures of mm -hmm. the South, because it's one of those places that holds you at a distance, mm -hmm. right? It's not a, pla you know, you, yes, people right. are gracious, but it, part of it is because you can't even sort of make your way into the neighborhood. Right, you can't be on the streets, and then, and, and also, how would someone be taken? Right. What are you if doing? If they're, yeah. you know, the wandering Mary of town. Right. right. Like, I mean, literally, <laughs> what Wait, would? Why are you here? Right. right. Yes. What's? Oh, this this person has lost it. What What do they do? I mean, that's yes. also just comes has something to do with the freedom of, of right. walking. I mean, yes. Right. Um, you have yeah breached certain social right. conventions. Right. You, yeah. 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 Are there questions? Yeah. Um, I have a question here that says. In your book, you discuss wanting to be dropped off at the edge of the school parking lot, feeling a mismatch with the school you attended. What advice would you give students who may feel similarly about Princeton? Mm. Y'all are coming with the questions. <laughs> you know, this that was really an important thread in that book for me was I was trying to think about what it meant to grow up in an area of the city that was cut off from the rest of itself, what it meant to grow up on a street that was cut off from the rest of itself, what it meant mm. to buy into a certain story about cut offness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of the shame I'm feeling mm. about the house, about the condition of the house, about what it means about me, is that I'm conflating the condition of. Uh, you know, being a kid from the short end of a long street mm -hmm. with my actual worth, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So in those moments when I'm, you know, I don't want my mother to be seen by my classmates because I feel like, you know, I'm different, I'm not like them. Mm -hmm. When I don't want our car to be seen because I think it's a lesser than car. Mm -hmm. There is such danger, I've come to know, in conflating, mm, mm -hmm. you know, the sort of circumstances of your life with who you are. And it's also equally as easy to do. And, and, but it's now something that I'm very hyper aware of, right? That, yeah. that there is no circumstantial design that tells me something about who I am. Yes. That who, who I am is completely separate from the circumstantial design. And then, of course, that very, very easily becomes about race in America. Mm -hmm. Because if you are then believing, right, that like the fact that we have a house on sinking grounds in an area of the city that has the worst zoning policy imaginable, mm. is that actually about me? That, right. Right? Like, what do I have to do with zoning? I, I am six months old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So it's like a way. So I think going back to the question, it's sort of, you know, that moment of shame of not claiming who I am, who my mother is, all these beautiful things that she has created and made for us, um, was a way of distancing myself from myself. Mm -hmm. And so I think to not conflate, to not imagine that the circumstances are you, and to again go back to whatever that home is, right, that exists whether you're in Princeton or not. Yeah. Um, is, is the key, but that can be hard to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Especially in the today, I think. It's so hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think especially in a display generation, mm -hmm. right? So the self is supposed, there's so much pressure to spectacularize what, mm -hmm. who and what you are. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then to make a spectacle, and of course that 
you know, a photo or an image is mm -hmm. a fixed thing, right? Mm -hmm. And we're breathing people, breathing. right? And we're like, um, but I just, I mean, I, you know, I think just to, to the, because the student, it, it, it is one of those things that resonates so deeply because I hear it so mm -hmm. much, this, you know, the, the, the thing of being misfitted to mm -hmm. certain institutions. And I think it's really important to keep in mind that when you are a member of any institution, you become part of its creation, right? You mm, are yes. co, you are co-creator of what this That's place so is. Great. Right, so what, so ethically, you know, having that experience, so I, part of the, Part of the responsibility becomes making it different. That is so. That you know? is so powerful. It, you know, that is that's it, because, you know, I mean, remembering that Princeton is this also hyper mythologized right. place yes. that is very happy in its story of itself. Right. right? <laughs> yes. So whenever so. you have hyper mythologized places. Um, it's very hard. It's like yeah. it's like Carrie Mae Weems in the photographs in Rome. Yes, where she talks about um, these buildings as like edifices of power. Mm -hmm. That they are literally designed so that when you stand next to them, you feel like nothing, nothing. and no one. Yes, and if you actually internalize the feeling that the building makes you feel, then you will never ever fight against it, mm -hmm. right? It will have subsumed you and subdued you. Yes. That's like the, the, the whole focus of this series of photographs. Yeah. And, and I think that's precisely what you're saying, right? Yeah. Is that, but there's actually the opportunity from inside mm -hmm. to make something new of it. Yeah. Opportun imperative, maybe. Even right. I mean, I I don't know. I've, it feels so essential with all of these institutions of power, mm -hmm. sure. from the publishing industry oh, to all of them. universities, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I love the way you talk about the communities in New Orleans because mm -hmm. people hold on despite, mm -hmm. you know, um, the di the diaspora that's been mm -hmm. created, mm -hmm. the destabilization, you know, the gentrification. Sure. People are still there. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Do we have time for another we'll question? One more. Yeah. yeah, I'll say the last question then will be what is it like to love a place that no longer exists physically but holds great significance in your life nonetheless? Mm. Wow, these questions. You know, that is a bizarre feeling, I think. Mm. Um, because often, I, 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 when I go back and I sort of go to the spot where the house was, I think, you know, it's, it's sort of like, wow, if I hadn't written about this place, would it have existed? Right, it's like, it, it, it's hard to imagine it having been there. Mm. And then I think, when I think of all of the, families in New Orleans who had such houses, you know. Um, it's sort of, maybe it goes back to that idea of the object or the piece of furniture, that it's something now that I can have, I can sort of rearrange within myself. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a lot of the question that I um, was asking myself and writing on the wall when I was doing this book was, you know, how can I resurrect a house with words? Is it possible? Right? And, and maybe that gets to why I write in particular and maybe even the limits of what it means to have written, which mm -hmm. is that, you know, the place existed and now it's gone. But this is also um, what Whitfield Lavelle is talking about in his paintings, right? That, that is it actually gone, mm -hmm. right? Or is there a sort of invisible imprint that we can no longer see. And, and maybe that's also a climate question. Mm. On that note, that gorgeous note, thank you so <laughs> thank very you. much. This was so much fun. It was beautiful. Thank you. Thank All you. Right.